a light aeroplane crashed. The two passengers were killed. Only the pilot, Edward Cummings, survived. What was the cause of the crash? Mrs Simon, the widow of one of the passengers, voiced her suspicions. This is the second day of the libel case, Cummings versus Simon, in Fulchester Crown Court. Dr Hayward, regarding this medical condition which my learned friend has called a pretty mal absence, have you ever at any time observed such a lapse of consciousness on Mr Cummings' part? Only when he's putting, sir. <laughs> it's comforting to know, Doctor, that one's failure with the putter can be due to an epileptic condition. No, that's not what I meant, mm -hmm. my lord. Uh, all I meant to say was that I do not believe that Ted Cummings has ever suffered from any form of epilepsy. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. You may leave the witness box. I call Alfred Donoghue, my lord. Mm. You are Alfred Tresco Donoghue of 17 Birch Grove, Guildford, Surrey. I am. And you were an inspector of accidents employed by the Department of Trade and Industry. To be precise, I was an inspector of accidents in brackets operations. Oh, and what is the significance of the brackets, Mr. Donoghue? It differentiates my job from that of inspector of accidents engineering. In brackets? Yes, my lord. Yeah. What are your qualifications, Mr. Donoghue? Sixteen, five years in the RAF, followed by 16 years as an airline pilot, and seven in the accident investigation branch of the DTI. Uh, Department of Trade, Trade and, Industry, and Industry, yes, thank you, Mr. Donahue, but it would be helpful if we could avoid abbreviations. As your Lordship pleases. What is your present occupation, Mr. Donahue? I am a consultant on aviation matters to several private companies. I see. Now, have you read the report on the crash near Fulchester Aerodrome in which Louis Simon and April Hammond were killed? I have, sir. And my Lord, the uh, Civil Aviation Accident Report, number 24A-73, stroke is another agreed document. You will find it at uh, pages 4 to 11 of the agreed bundle. Yes, I have it, Mr. Ingham. How does the investigation team go about establishing the cause of the accident? Well, once one has identified the registration number of the aircraft, its type, where it was being flown to, then one attempts to establish the impact attitude of the aircraft. That is to say, its attitude in pitch, roll and heading. Mr. Donahue, could you elucidate in non-technical language? Pitch, my lord... Mm is the angle at which the aircraft struck the ground. Roll is the angle of the wings, and heading is, is the... the direction in which it was flying. Yes, correct, my lord. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Donahue. <laughs> now, Mr. Donahue... Does... Then one must also establish the configuration of the aircraft. The what? That is to say, my lord, whether the flaps were down or up, whether the engines were under power or not, whether the undercarriage was retracted or not. Thank you, Mr. Donoghue, for being so instructive. Thank you, Mr. Ingram. Lord, Mr. Donoghue, now, does the accident report mention any mechanical defect which must have existed in the aircraft prior to takeoff? Yes, sir, it does. What is that defect? Well, interestingly enough, according to the report, there was a fatigue crack in the heat exchange unit of the cabin heater system. Now, what would be the effect of such a crack? Carbon monoxide gas would be present in the cabin itself during the flight. I see. And what would be the effect of the presence of carbon monoxide gas upon the pilot? The effect is very similar to that of alcoholic intoxication, uh, drunkenness. The effect on the pilot would be akin to alcoholic intoxication? Yes, sir, it would. I see. Thank you, Mr. Donoghue. Mr. Donoghue, does the Civil Aviation Accident Report give any single cause for the crash of Mr. Cummings' lab wing aircraft? No, sir, it does not. The report establishes two facts. One, the existence of a fatigue crack in the heat exchange unit. And two, that when the aircraft struck the ground, it was under power. Uh, that is to say, the engines were on. Now, how does this heat exchange system work? Well, according to the scientific... It has a special heater system fueled from the main tanks like a small oil stove, you might say. So any defect in the heating system wouldn't affect the performance of the aircraft in, in flight? Not mechanically, no, sir. But the carbon monoxide fumes might have affected the pilot. Indeed, it has been known. And you said that carbon monoxide poisoning is akin to drunkenness. Yes, sir. Now, does the report indicate whether there was sufficient uh, carbon monoxide in the cabin to have affected the pilot? No, sir, it does not. And were the uh, bodies of... Uh, Mr. Simon and Mrs. Hammond, subjected to certain tests. Yes, sir. Tissue samples were taken from the deceased and sent for gas chromatography. Oh, and what is that, Mr. Donahue? It is a test, my lord, whereby the presence of carbon monoxide and various drugs can be detected. And was there any signs of 
carbon monoxide in the tissue samples taken from the two passengers? No, sir, there was not. So it would be true to say, would it not, Mr Donoghue, that there is no proof that Mr Cummings was overcome by carbon monoxide? Uh, there's no simple answer to that. Because of the fatigue crack, there must have been carbon monoxide present somewhere in the cabin. But in what quantity or what particular effect it would have had on Mr Cummings, I, I cannot say. Yes. Now, Mr Donoghue, the engines were under power when the plane crashed. Presumably, Mr Cummings had not turned off the fuel cocks by the moment of impact. There's no need to presume, sir. He hadn't. But wouldn't turning off the fuel cocks be correct emergency procedure for an experienced pilot? It is laid down in the <coughs> manual, sir. Yes. And apart from the fatigue crack, it would be true to say, would it not, that the plane was in good mechanical order? Yes, sir. And that weather conditions were suitable for flying? Yes, they were. Now, Mr. Donoghue, in the uh, Civil Aviation Accident Report, Section 1, Part 1, it says that uh, Mr. Cummings' aircraft went into a 90-degree dive and started to spin. It recovered at ground level, but the port wing touched. Yes, sir. Yes. Now, is that a manoeuvre that an experienced pilot would attempt at 1,600 feet? No, sir. In layman's language, that is a recipe for sudden death. Yes. When is an aircraft most prone to spin? When it is mishandled in a steep turn. Miss Hamilton, what way? Well, the aircraft may have 60 degrees of bank on it and be pulling 2 to 3 G. If the pilot doesn't handle the controls with sensitivity, he's in trouble. Yes. Now, Mr Cummings would appear to have been attempting just such a turn before his crash, would he not? Yes. Now, Mr Donahue, one of the, of the symptoms of an epileptic seizure is a sudden tensing of the muscles. If a pilot suffered a sudden muscular tension or rigidity, what effect would that have on the performance of the aircraft that he was flying? Well, any tensing of the hands on the controls would tend to increase the G, causing a high-speed stall. Yes. The aircraft would flick and go into a spin. Yes. And if the pilot uh, lost consciousness at the, for a moment at the same time, he'd be unable to correct that spin. Uh, that is so, sir. Yes. Now, Mr Donoghue, as an aviation expert, would you say that the circumstances of Mr. Cummings' crash were consistent with him having suffered a petty mal seizure? Well, there are many no, other... Are the circumstances consistent, Mr. Donahue? Yes, the crash is consistent with a petty mal seizure. Thank you. No further questions, my lord. Mr. Donahue, just a minute, Mr. Ingrams. Mr. Donahue, to your knowledge, is there any record of an epileptic seizure causing a plane crash. Yes, my lord, there has been one, to my knowledge. Yes, but surely, in order to obtain a pilot's licence, a man must undergo a most stringent examination. Yes, my lord, but only if a pilot is over 40 is an EEG compulsory. Abbreviations again, Mr Donoghue. I'm sorry, my hmm. lord. EEG electroencephalograph. This is a machine that can detect abnormal activity in the brain like epilepsy. Uh, Mr. Ingrams, how old is the plaintiff? Uh, 36, my lord. Thank you. Pray continue. My lord. Mm. Uh, Mr. Donoghue, there is a point I should like to clarify, if I may. Now, you said that there must have been carbon monoxide present in the cabin. Yes, sir. And you further said that the effect of carbon monoxide in sufficient quantity would be to induce a euphoric condition akin to alcoholic intoxication. That is so, sir. Now, Mr. Donoghue, in your expert opinion, would such a condition account for Mr. Cummings losing control of the aircraft? Yes, sir, it would. It would? Thank you, Mr. Donoghue. Thank you, Mr. Donoghue. You may leave the witness box. The final witness for the plaintiff is Judith Turner, my lord. Yes. Now, you were a friend of April Hammond's. Her best friend, yes. You, uh, you confided in one another? <laughs> well, what else are best friends for? Now, you knew of her relationship with Mr. Simon. Oh, yes. Yes, she told me all about it. Poor cow. You were sorry for her? Well, of course. Louis was an old swine. Well, look at the way he treated her. And how did he treat her? April had been with him for nearly two years. Well, that's a long time, particularly when you're April's age. How old was Mrs. Hammond? Oh, she must have been 28, my lord, more or less. Well, she said that Louis had told her how yes, he'd get yes, a divorce. This is hearsay, they... Mr. Ingram. Uh, yes, my lord, it is. Mm. What, what does that mean, my it lord? It means, Mr. Turner... Um, that your evidence must be direct. You may not say what someone told you that someone else has said. Oh, I see. 
Uh, but April did tell yes, me about... Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Miss Turner, but perhaps I could rephrase the question, It Lord. would be helpful, Mr. Ingram. Yes, my lord. <laughs> Miss Turner, is it true to say that uh, Mrs. Hammond had reason to suppose that Mr. Simon intended to marry her? Yes. But apart from the fact that uh, Mr. Simon was already married, Mrs. Hammond herself was married. <laughs> that wasn't a marriage. That was a sick joke. Now, to your knowledge, did Mrs. Hammond press Mr. Simon to marry her? Mm, constantly, yes. Well, for the last two weeks before the crash, anyway. She was on at Louis all the time. About marriage? Of course. I tell you, April was getting desperate. Uh, why? Well, she'd found out that Louis was keeping another woman somewhere in a flat. Well, it was only a kid, she said, but she was pretty choked about it all the same. And when did Mrs. Hammond discover that she had a rival? Mm, about two days before they went to Fulchester. Knowing this, nevertheless, she went away with Mr. Simon. Well, when a man with that amount of money whistles, you come running, don't you? Mind you, I was amazed to hear she'd been killed in a plane crash. Amazed? Why? Oh, well, April hated planes. What? Well, she got airsick, you see. Uh, that was why she never flew. You mean Mrs. Hammond never flew at all? Well, not while I knew her, no. She always used to say the sight of an aeroplane made her sick. This was a short flight, was it not? At a low altitude, over some property? Well, all the more reason for not going, I'd have thought. Oh, unless she was determined to settle things with Louis one way or the other. Oh, my Lord, this is complete fantasy. No further questions, my Lord. 